you, you know what I'm going to ask or say, right? Good morning. Good morning. Wow. <laughs> that is fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> we welcome you to Good Shepherd, and we are glad to have you here to worship with us. Praise the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and give glory and honor to the Father and the Holy Spirit who's, who enlightens us. This morning, I'm not going to do much with announcements, just a couple to call to your attention. <clears throat> One is that gallons of care that we've been promoting this Saturday, November 2nd. We're going to pack all those up. So uh, in your bulletin, it says 9 a.m., come here to help with that event. And then next Sunday, next Sunday, 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 is the end of daylight saving time. So you get an extra hour of sleep, but if you don't, you'll be here early. And I'm just making sure that you know to set your clock back an hour. Uh, the other thing I thought I'd mention is uh, I'm going to go down to this festival, and if anybody would like to go, I have room in a car, so you can contact myself or Deb at the Bible school today at 4.30. Let's read the psalm together here on our insert, Psalm 5. Oh, and I should mention, our secretary and her hubby have their 29th wedding anniversary today. Yeah! And naturally, they're not sitting together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. Listen to my cry for help. My God and my God, King and my God, for you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. Yeah, you can read along. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait in expectation. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you, the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men the Lord abhors. But I, by your great mercy, will come into your house in reverence will I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make straight your way before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with destruction. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongue they speak deceit. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous, you surround them with your, as a shield. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here as our shield, as our defender, as our God, as our protector. We give you thanks and praise, and may this worship time, your word that is spoken and, and given to us in word and song, be giving you praise and honor and majesty. In Jesus' name, amen. The choir piece today is one that we have had for about a year. We've been practicing on it. And it shows the Lord's work in mysterious and wondrous ways because the name of this piece is Going Home. And it talks about when the Father sends for me and when he speaks my name, I will leave my earthly home and I will enter heaven's, heaven's wondrous gate where streets of gold the kingdom's glory to behold, I will be going home. 
And as you hear the message today from 2 Timothy, the last chapter, Paul is saying, I've run the race. I fought the fight. I'm going home. And I just smiled when I thought of this because I had no idea when we were going to sing this. And I said, well, let's just do it the last Sunday in October. And lo and behold, the Lord said, sure, that sounds like a really good plan because I already had it in mind. (laughs) That's why we're not singing a Reformation one. So, okay.
Thank you, choir. As you can imagine, that's, that's a very powerful message. But what a promise for all of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus. Get to go home. I get to go home. Let's see. Yeah. Praises and petitions. I want to make sure I'm in the right order because I'm already emotional. So, <laughs> Kenny. I like to pray for the children in the children's hospital. They need help. Bad. Yes. They got real bad cancer. I have a good prayer. Okay. Could you pray? Could you say a prayer for some of the the people that are sick that go to this church? Yep. I don't know what you mean. Okay. So pray for those who are ill and sick, and then pray for the children in the children's hospital and those fighting cancer. Okay. Unspoken. Unspoken. See, I told you we sing for you, right? Pardon? We sang for yes, you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, Lee and Shirley are leaving for Florida Thursday. Okay, so pray for safe travels and staying well. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Okay, Stacy, who has been fighting the Lyme disease. Broken tailbone, so now she found another broken bone. So it'll extend her time in bed rest. Okay, so Stacy. All right. Yes. Dawn? Okay. You have? Um, yeah, Tadia has a friend, his name is Mike, who is struggling with some mental health issues, a uh, sophomore in high school, so it's a prayer for him. Uh, Mike me having mental uh, health issues, a sophomore in high school? Okay. So. Okay, <coughs> Karen, right? Kara. Kara. Kara, who has had the liver transplant, the rejection drugs are not working the way they should. They're going the wrong, They're going the wrong way. So pray for healing there and adjustment in meds or whatever they might need to do. Jim and Tammy Martin, Debbie. And I'm sorry, after his lung transplant? Okay, so pray for Jim and Tammy Martinson for their marriage and, uh, because of complications with his lung transplant and for marriage. And, okay, did strength. Okay. Right. So strength under the stressful conditions. Right. Mike. Yeah, we already thanked you for that, but you weren't here. <laughs> yep. Got you covered there, Mike. You got good. <laughs> Sarah. Oh. Great. Tom Langamo's surgery on his neck went well. Right? Okay. <laughs> so his name is Bill. So he's in the hospice? No. 
almost, but so pray for Okay, so so Ellie Ellie and Bill, and because he's dying, that pray for comfort in that. Okay. Let's see. All right. <laughs> So Paula going in for spinal fusion sometime end of November, December. Okay, okay Bev. Oh, yeah. Okay. So continued prayer for Mackenzie, the 21-year-old that we know she has stage 4 bone cancer. So she had a better week this week after being released from the hospital. So continued prayer for her. Hannah. Okay. And she found out she's getting arthritis in her feet. All right. So Hannah's mom has feet problems with bone spurs. Now plantar fasciitis and arthritis is coming. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, Tony took Joanne to the hospital or emergency room today because she was having something happening with her eyes. So we will... Pray for them to and the persecuted church. Anything else? All right. <coughs> Father God, we thank you <clears throat> for the time we have to be able to come to you in prayer. We know it's a privilege that you made for us by dying on the cross and making it possible for us to go through that holy of holies, that curtain, and be able to come to the mercy seat. Otherwise, it was only once a year, and only one person could go. And now it's open to all of us, as you, Jesus, are our high priest. You are the one we run to, we cry to, we bring our requests to, and as we were going through Sunday school today, we know that you are the one who has all power and authority. You are the authority to heal and power to heal and to make your will known. And sometimes with your answers, it is for a bigger and grander purpose than we can even imagine. We give you thanks for Mike and Monica for 29 years of marriage. We thank you for the witness that is to all of us and that we would pray for all our marriages, that you would strengthen and undergird them with your word and you, Jesus, being the head of every home, that we would give you honor and praise and submit to that. We pray for the persecuted church, those who are in anguish <clears throat> just to believe, just to express their faith. Thank you that you never leave them or forsake them and that Sometimes it may seem as though their prayers aren't answered, but they are in your timing, in your way. And we lift up before you those children in the children's hospital and those who are sick in our, our church or community. We know you take care of all that. We also lift up before you unspoken prayers, things that we don't know how to put into words or just we're still even trans trying to get through on our own mind what's going on. But you are the one who prays even for us, Jesus, as you sit next to the Father in heaven and the Holy Spirit within us, with groanings too deep for words. Pray for safe travel for Lee and Shirley as they leave Thursday and keeping them well. We lift up before you Stacy and her long, long battle being extended in bed rest. 
that we would ask that you would heal, that you would comfort. You see far more than we do. You know far more than we do. But we still ask, because that's what you told us to do. Ask, seek, knock. (coughs) Lift up before you uh, Dawn, Tom's stepmother who died, and with the family. That you would be a comfort for them. That your presence would be felt, and that they know that they can turn to you. You are the God who makes a way where there seems to be no other way. Lift up before you Mike with his mental issues and battling health. It's so tough when it's older, but even when a, a young person in sophomore in high school, it's, we just don't think it should be that way. And you know it isn't, because when you created everything, you made it perfect. Help us, O oh Lord, to be lights shining and pointing toward you. Uh, we lift up before you uh, Karen with the liver trans- uh, Cara with a liver transplant and, and the rejection meds that aren't seem to be working well, that you would be in and through that. If there's a possibility, you know it. You are the one who is able to heal. We always are searching, but you, you are confident in what your plan is. Help us to be accepting of that. Be with Jim and Debbie. <clears throat> in their stress of this uh, lung transplant that Jim has had, and, and give them strength. Be there with them in each step and daily moment that they do not rely on themselves but turn to you. And, and that Tom, with his successful uh, neck surgery, that you would give, help him give thanks to you and praise to you and honor you and glory you, to you as he lives, knowing that it is by your hand. And be with Ellie and Bill and Bill passing slowly from this earth and that you would bring comfort to them uh, that their peace may be not found here in the earth in the world but when you and your word uh, be with paula as prepare for a surgery in the upcoming month for spinal fusion that you would be with and through that your healing hand your guiding hand and be with mackenzie we lay before you those things that hurt But as the uh, message in the choir's piece is going home, where there is no suffering, where no more pain, we should look to heaven as Paul looked to heaven as the reward, that final place where we are greeted. Be with Hannah's mom and issues with her feet and bone spurs and plantar fasciitis and arthritis that you would be there healing and giving wisdom, your healing touch. And be with Joanne. We don't know exactly what is going on with uh, Joanne, but be with Tony and her. Uh, Give wisdom and peace. Help them know we are praying for them and that you are there with them when we can't be and that your presence is always good, good God. Your good presence is there. In the name of Jesus, amen. Call on uh, <clears throat> Tony, who is not going to read. I will, <laughs> unless somebody else is scheduled for that. Uh, if you would rise for the reading of God's word, go to the book of Ruth. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I got the rolled pot. Ah, that's why it is. <laughs> Thank you, Clarence. I have an old bulletin up here. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. First reading of the Old Testament reading this morning is from Genesis 4, verses 1 through 15. In Genesis 4, verses 1 through 15, in Jesus' name. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offerings, 
but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. Second reading, the New Testament reading, is from Luke 18, verses 9 through 17. Luke 18, verses 9 through 17. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. He beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the little children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Here ends the reading. In your blue hymnal on page 105, We'll recite the statement of our faith by using the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> 105 in your blue hymnal. <coughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Call upon the ushers to receive our morning offering and tithes. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are always reminded, and we should be, that whatever we see, whatever we have around us is only a trust we are only given it for a short period of time to be stewards of. 
and that nothing really belongs to us. It is all yours. We thank you for the privilege to be part of that giving, part of that moving out the message of salvation. We thank you for the privilege of being able to do these things with your hand guiding us. Give these gifts with your power and authority to move them and to multiply them in any way you see fit for your kingdom's glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Would you please stand as I read our text for this morning from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, and then jumping to verse 16 through 18. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6 through 8, and then 16 through 18. Reading in Jesus' name. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word. It is truth. Lord, we pray that you would sanctify us in this truth this morning as we hear it. Lord, speak to us both your law and your gospel. Lord, that we might come to repentance and renew our faith. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As you may know, today is Reformation Sunday, a very important day in the life of the church. Uh, Usually for certain parts of the year, there are certain texts that they're there every year. Uh, This year I wanted to switch it up a little bit, so I I chose the alternate readings. And 2 Timothy is, is part of that. The Word of God before us today gives us the Christian's view of life and death. We see, and we've been looking at the Apostle Paul Uh, these last few weeks, the Apostle Paul would soon die. Not from cancer or from some other disease, but from the executioner's blade. You see, he was on trial for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. This was part of the persecution carried out under Emperor Nero in the first century. It was from his prison cell that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. In a sense, it was his last will and testament. He saw death on the horizon for him. But how, how does he face this impending death? He faces it the same way he lived his life. He faces death humbly, ever ready for his Lord. This word from God through Paul helps to prepare us too. Not just for death, but for life. No matter how young or old you are, no matter if death seems near or far, we're called to live humbly and be ready for our Lord. But how do you live a humble life? You live a humble life by, one, striving in your service to God, and two, by resting in his rescue, as Paul did. Paul writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Paul had served the Lord now faithfully for over 30 years. He has no list of regrets that he mentions here, And that might sound kind of arrogant if you take it out of context, but remember, this is the same Paul who years earlier wrote to Timothy and said this, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. I am the worst. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. See, Paul has no regrets that he mentions, because he, not because he has done everything right during his life, not because he had lived out his dreams or to the fullest, 
No, Paul has no regrets because God's mercy in Christ had forgiven him of all his wrongs. There was no greater thing, no greater dream than knowing that he's going to be with Christ in heaven. God's mercy in Christ had not only changed Paul's view of death, but also changed the way he lived his life each and every day. Here's a question for each of us. How differently do you live your life because of Jesus? Now, in view of of Christ's mercy, Paul lived each day as a thank offering to his God and Savior. You might remember what a thank offering is. If you were to look in the Old Testament, you would see that along with some of the Old Testament sacrifices, there was something called a drink offering. Uh, It would be a cup of wine that they would pour out beside the altar. It, was a, it wasn't the sacrifice itself, it was just to accompany it. It was a thank offering. And they would do these types of sacrifices, where the, a whole burnt sacrifice was dedicated to the Lord, each morning and each evening. So even as this wine was poured out beside the altar, Paul is viewing his, his death in this way. Right? Paul's blood would be poured out in martyrdom after a life of daily service that was dedicated to his Lord. In the Old Testament sacrifices, the, the drink offering was the last thing that would happen. And so too with Paul's martyrdom, this marked the end of his service to the Lord here on earth. So was this a premature end for Paul? I mean, Paul was... Still healthy, he's still capable of doing his work, of doing service to the Lord. He hadn't retired from mission work. The world might say that he died too young. But Paul shows us here that, and he recognizes that the timing of his departure was in God's hands alone. It was not a Roman courtroom that controlled his fate, but his life was in his Savior's hands. He could pray like David did in Psalm 31 when he says, My times are in your hands. And this isn't just this, these times here towards the end of his life. No, Paul knew that every moment of his life, especially, he was especially conscious of this after his conversion. Every moment of his life was in God's hands. And so he strove to humbly serve his Lord. Once again, we've seen this at other times in the other letters. Paul uses a sports picture when he writes this. I have fought the good fight. Now the the Greek words here aren't really referring to a military battle or something like that, but to an athletic contest, whether that's running in a race or wrestling an opponent. Just as an athlete strives and and strains towards his goal, so Paul was striving to serve his Lord, even in death. He did so like a runner with his eyes on the finish line. And notice how he describes the finish line here. Verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but, all, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He's talking about a, a crown, an award, a, a reward. And who is it who gains this victor's crown? Paul tells us, only the righteous. Because it's called the crown of righteousness. Righteousness. That raises a few questions. Who can stand before the holy judge that he talks about? Who has the righteousness that measures up to this right standard of perfection that God has? Well, we learn from some of our other readings today, it's certainly not the one who, like the Pharisee in our gospel text, the one who boasted of his own righteousness and exalted himself, Amongst others. 
It's certainly not the one who thinks they can enter Christ's kingdom on their own terms. No, if you were to read in Romans, you would find that, no, there is none righteous. Not even one. No one is righteous in themselves. Except, of course, Jesus. Jesus is righteous in himself. You see, our striving does not win the victor's crown at the end of the race. Rather, we strive because of our champion, Jesus, who has already won the race and won the crown for us. His righteous life counts as your record. And he will exalt the humble life, he tells us. He invites even the littlest ones to come to him. It is Jesus who covers your filthy rags with the white robe of righteousness. It is Jesus who has won the victory by rising from the dead. And he is the one that's coming as the righteous judge in the future. Thankfully, as Christians, we know that this righteous and holy judge is also our Savior. And so it's no wonder that Paul longs for Jesus to make his final appearance at his second coming. He longs for that. It's no wonder that Paul, during his life, had guarded his faith as a dear treasure to keep. And so he clung to Jesus and his righteousness alone. And so do we, Christians. We must cling to Jesus as our righteousness. We must strive to live humbly, to live ready for his coming again. In the meantime, serving him. Strive like an athlete pouring out every ounce of strength that you have for Jesus. Strive to serve him in all that you do. We're called to use our time that God has given us. Whether the finish line is close to us or it's far away, we're called to use our time wisely in striving to serve our Lord. Now Paul himself, we know, he served as the apostle to the Gentiles. He was chosen for that role. But what about you? What about me? How can, how can you serve the Lord? What is your service that you have? Well, let's consider a few things here. Think about all the different roles that God has placed you in in life. Sometimes that's called a vocation. Where has God placed you? And second, how can you carry out the responsibility of those roles with Christian love? Well, first, let's just think about what your roles are, right? Are you a parent? Are you a grandparent or a child? Are you a husband or a wife? Are you a student, an employee, a boss, a retiree? Don't forget that you're also a citizen of this country. You're also a a member of the church. The question is, how best do you serve the Lord in those roles? Well, you do it best by diligently and humbly carrying out those responsibilities according to God's priorities, not your own. Those priorities being faith towards Jesus and with love for other people. That's how God calls us to carry out our vocations. This is your service to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Even the most mundane things become a thank offering to God when you do it to glorify your Savior. Luther has a very famous quote, and I won't get it exactly right, but he talks about even changing a dirty diaper of your baby is is thanking God when you do it to glorify your Lord. It doesn't matter what it is. Glorify your Lord in all that you do. But we, we often forget about the other part of that too, right? Don't forget that carrying out your roles involves not only actions, but your prayers too. We can serve by praying for others. Even when our physical strength has failed us, 
your prayer is powerful and effective before Christ. Through faith in Jesus, you have the ear of your Father in heaven. Sometimes I get the impression that people think that pastors have somehow a a special connection to God, that he hears our prayers more than he hears others. That's not true. Okay? God hears your prayers when you come to him in faith. And so, pray for other people. Pray for Christ's love to fill them, too. And as we know, Paul, as he writes this, is, is, is writing from one pastor to another. From Paul to Timothy. And they both have, are in full-time ministry. In a sense, Paul is passing the baton on to Timothy in this race. And so, as we know, there have been many pastors since. And if you are a young man, you need to think about what God might have for you. Maybe he wants you to go into the ministry. Even if you're not so young, right, Mark? Think about that, though. As a parent or a a grandparent, maybe you have a child or grandchild to encourage to do that, to at least consider it. Because let me tell you, this world needs the pastors. The world needs pastors. And it seems that pastors are always retiring or dying, right? That's the natural case of things. At least in the AFLC, it seems that there are never enough pastors for all of the congregations. Even though these last few years, we've had bigger classes at the seminary, it just seems that we will never catch up. We'll never have enough. But remember, it's not just pastors who serve the Lord. See, that's every Christian's duty. Whether you're a pastor or a parishioner, We must live humbly and ready for our Lord, striving to serve him in whatever ways he gives us to serve him. But we don't strive under compulsion or driven by worry or fear or anything like that. Rather, we live humbly, ready for our Lord by resting in his rescue. That's what Paul talks about in the second half here. Paul rested securely in the Lord's rescue that he had for him. That's the way he lived his life, and that's the way he was now facing death. Do you remember some of the challenges that Paul faced during his life, during his mission work? It was not a restful life. He went through much. He was rejected by his own people. He was continually on the road, During his mission work, he was stoned. He was imprisoned. He was even shipwrecked. That's just a short list. I'm sure Paul wrestled with loneliness and worry and fear during his ministry. But ultimately, as we read this, we see that he lived humbly. He was ready for the Lord and he was resting in the rescue that the Lord worked for him no matter how difficult life was going to get, no matter what storm was blowing in. He lived his last days like that as well, too. Even though he made it through that first hearing, as he tells us, Paul knew that his imprisonment would end with his execution. He knew that, and he was okay with that. The Lord was at his side even when everyone else had deserted him. Jesus had given him the words to say as he stood before that courtroom. And Jesus promised that he would do that for his people, for his disciples, that he would supply the words in their testimony. And as Paul stood there in that courtroom, the preaching of Jesus Christ rang out in that heathen place. As he stood before an earthly judge, as he was witnessed by many onlookers. The courtrooms would have been huge back then so that people could stand there and watch. They seemed to have a a fascination with that. Seemed kind of like us and our judge shows on TV today, right? There was a huge crowd there when Paul testified. 
But even that testimony was not going to bring Paul's release. Instead, Paul confesses in verse 18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. And that, brothers and sisters, is the ultimate way that the Lord rescues each of his dear children. He rescues us through death. He brings us into the eternal safety of our heavenly home. That's the ultimate answer to our prayer when we say, but deliver us from evil. From this world of sin and evil and pain. Right? This is how God delivers us. And in the meantime, as we live, we must live humbly, ready for our Lord, and rest in this future rescue. But you know what? We tend to instead fret and worry instead of resting. We're inclined to strain and struggle, but not in the right way. We worry about not having enough. We worry about pain and sickness. We worry when we watch the news on TV. We worry about our our job or our our grades. We worry about our family. And then we try to combat those worries by trying harder. By thinking, if I have enough saved up or if I work longer hours, if I follow the doctor's orders or if I do this or that, then, then things might get better. We're inclined to strain and struggle, but it's not the striving to serve our Lord that we had talked about earlier. Rather, we strain and struggle trying to alleviate our worries by improving our lot in life. How foolish we can be as sinners. Our worrying about things is doubting the Lord's care. That's the opposite of faith. Straining and struggling as if it all depended on us is faith in ourselves. That's the opposite of faith in Christ. How is it that we get it so wrong? How much we need God to rescue us. From the darkness deeper than any Roman dungeon that Paul could have been in, we pray with the psalmist, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the cry, to the voice of my pleas for mercy. And before any one of us ever cried out to, the, to God, before we were even born, the Lord answered us. Jesus rescued you, dear sinner. He rescued you. As the Son of God entered the depths of darkness in this world, by the cross, he rescued you. He nailed your sins to that tree. He set you free from bondage to your sin. And one day we have the promise that he will even rescue us from the jaws of death by resurrecting us from the grave. God has been merciful to us as sinners. The same Jesus who rescued us, who died for us, he's the same Jesus who watches over you even now. He's the same Jesus who is coming again. He will rescue no matter how troublesome life becomes, no matter how painful or horrible it may get. Just trust him. Just trust him. Jesus will rescue you. He will rescue all who long for his coming and bring us safely to our heavenly home, the place where he wipes every tear from our eyes. So in the meantime, while we wait, live humbly. Be ready for your Lord's coming at any moment and rest securely in his rescue as you joyfully strive in your service to him. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit, Lord. Helping us to look at our life the way you look at our life. 
but also to look at our future death the way that you look at it as well. Help us, Lord, to be an offering to you, a thank offering, that we might regularly be grateful and share that with other people for what you've done for us. Lord, thank you for your word and the way you lead us, for your Holy Spirit and the way that you give us strength as you gave Paul strength to make that last testimony before his death. Lord, we trust that you'll do the same for us, Lord, even now as we live our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, number 462 in the Red Hymnal.
Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.